Welcome to Vintage SF. Today, a special episode. We're going to be talking about the best of Hal Clement. But I'm joined today by Matt from Science Fiction Reads and Ira from Science Fiction Words of Wonder. So, guys, I thought maybe to start out with, we would look at our science fiction origin stories. Um, how you came to love science fiction and start getting a library of science fiction and moving on to creating your channels. Uh, who would like to start? Uh, I can start. Sure. Um, my origin is kind of uh, strange as it started so late. You know, I didn't read as a kid and I wasn't particularly interested in science fiction. Uh, I liked science fiction movies and I felt like something was kind of missing, but it never occurred to me to try reading uh, the genre. And as a young adult, like I read some things here and there, some random Stephen King, and someone put me onto uh, the Dark Tower series of his, and I read that and I enjoyed it, but I found the parts I liked the most was when it strayed into science fiction more than kind of urban fantasy. And I thought maybe I should try uh, reading science fiction, uh, the genre. So uh, I hopped on online and looked up some of the classics and some of the newer authors um, and accidentally stumbled on BookTube as a result. Uh, so then I did a lot of research on there. Um, then I made a trip to the bookstore, grabbed a 50% um, classic stuff like uh, Joe Haldeman's Forever War uh, and some older stuff, and then newer stuff like Alistair Reynolds and Greg Bear, uh, and just blew my mind. <laughs> I had never read anything like um, Alistair Reynolds' hard science fiction or the sense of wonder you get from older science fiction. And that was probably, I think, 2015. So I was 25 before I started reading as an adult, really, um, and just got obsessed with BookTube, but um, did not pull the trigger on making a, a channel until I think uh, September, 2021. And that was mainly mo motivated by not a lot of people talking about um, classic or vintage SF, which is what I was starting to realize I liked more of. Um, and now, you know, more than two years later, there's tons of channels. It's awesome. <laughs> it just exploded in popularity from wh uh, what I've seen. Um, yeah. And now I have, I've run into guys like you and have all these exchanges and uh, get different ideas from each other. It's great. Ira. That's about it. <laughs> yep. So for me, um, in school, I kind of just read because I had to until I got to the book, The Outsiders. And I really liked it. And so I went to the grocery store and just went to the rack and picked out my my very first book I ever picked out was Stephen King's Misery. Mm -hmm. And I read that. I read a couple. I got the Dark Tower. Um, the Gunslinger was my second book I ever picked out from the grocery store. And then so I was probably like 14 or something. And a friend of mine was like, you should read Ender's Game. So okay. I read the first three books. I think at the time, Children of the Mind wasn't out yet. I still haven't read that one, so I'm going to be reading that when I get to those books soon. Um, but I just, I kind of fell in love with it, but my life kind of, like once I turned 18, I went up to Alaska, I left home, and I kind of had a stretch where I didn't read so much. And then I was working at grocery stores at the time, and I, around the late uh, like 1999, uh, I worked with this guy who was big into science fiction and we, we had this thrift store right next to our grocery store and we would walk over there at lunch and he would just pass me books. And it was mostly all short stories, tons of Ray Bradbury. That was one of his favorite authors and just countless short story collections. I read so many, I don't even know which ones I read at the time. I've tried to keep track of everything I've read, but there's this kind of period where, you know, short stories is kind of hard to keep track of those. Um, but then completely fell in love with it, started getting into collecting um, Stephen King, science fiction. I have my video about the Easton Press series that kind of talks about the origins of, of how I started collecting these books and started reading, kind of branching out into some of the most classic vintage kind of science fiction books. 
And I was just blown away by everything I was reading there. And then from then that was around like 2000 from then till now I've, you know, I was, I was still reading. I wasn't reading as much. I had this big batch of, of reading back then. And then life kind of took over. I got in, I went back to college. I started a career, got married, always would read a few books a year, but it wasn't reading at the level that I did back then. And then when the, uh, the little slowdown or the, you know, the, the virus hit, I had a lot more free time on my hands and I discovered booktube right around then. And that's when I kind of reemerged into the reading mode. And at first I discovered a lot of these fantasy um, channels and I, I read a couple of fantasy series. I finally got around to reading Game of Thrones, which was great. And then I, I kind of stumbled across a few science fiction um, channels and they were talking about some interesting books. Moid, of course, he's a character. And then I just started finding all, well, actually first I, I didn't think there was that many channels out there and I started mine. And then you kind of see how the network of some of these smaller channels work. And I discovered a lot more. And like Matt said, it seems like it's grown even more since then. It's been, been great. Yeah. I think there's been a, uh as you say, a renaissance in vintage SF or interest in vintage SF. So I'm a bit older than you guys. I can remember back in the sixties, my dad watching the original Star Trek. And, uh, I was, uh, just starting elementary school at the end of the sixties. And so, uh, I was able to watch a little bit of that with him. But one of the cool things I grew up in the country, we had a three quarter hour ride on the bus to school and back from school but i get home just in time to watch reruns on tv uh that was when star trek started to be in rerun just perpetually in the in the 70s and so i saw the original star trek uh loved it of course and uh then around 1975 i think i have a copy here yeah around 1975 i'm in canada on Saturdays, we would see a show called Space 1999. And it's a classic. I wouldn't say it's a great classic, but it caught my imagination. And I started buying some novels that were novelizations of the series and the novelizations of Star Trek, which were by James Blish. Those were the first kind of science fiction books I bought. The rest of my story really takes place in the school library. That's where I discovered some writers like uh, the juvenile Heinlein novels. I think one was called The Rolling Stones. Uh, discovered Asimov's short stories. And then two novels hooked me forever. And that was Planet of the Apes by Pierre Boulle and Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke. So at that time, I was in junior high, and that was it. Loved it. And uh, so my origin story happens before Star Wars happened. Uh, of course, Star Wars really blew everything open for lots of people, too. Uh, when it comes to this channel, I, I took early retirement, and I was puttering around doing different things. But um, as you were saying, Ira, you know, life kind of uh, brought my reading down in terms of volume, and I was reading all sorts of things. But uh, I saw a video... It just came across the feed for YouTube from Outlaw Bookseller Stephen E. Andrews. Uh, I know that I know that Matt knows him. I, you do as well. And it was two grumpy old men talking about science fiction. And I go, you know what? They're talking about books I know about, and this would be fun to get into. And so I started collecting a few books, and then I just decided to jump in and talk about the books I was picking up. Um, and try to link my perspective from reading when I was a younger person to reading now. And it's just been a blast. And obviously finding you guys and other people online, uh, it's a, it's a nice community. Uh, people really seem to support each other and, and refer to each other as they're doing their videos. So. Yeah, it's the, uh, nicest online community that I've been a part of for sure. <laughs>
Yeah, I just recently saw there's a kind of a fantasy booktuber who did a, a video about like how much you make, how much she's made on YouTube. But she had this section about mean comments mm. and she even had she was showing some of the mean comments she had got. And I got to say, I, I've never had to delete a comment. Everybody's been nice. It's been great. So I think we're in a pretty good little um, niche here. Yeah, I agree. So next, I wanted to take a just to get a general impression of this book. Um, you know what? I, I'm going to say, I don't know about you, Ira, but I uh, first saw Matt starting to collect these books. I remember seeing him have a Lee Brackett book, I think, and some others and go, that's pretty cool. And when I picked up a few more or a few at a, a thrift, thrift store, I go, hmm. I think I'm going to go and find out some of my science fiction sources and see how many of these I can find. Yeah. Is it like that for you, Ira, or were you collecting them on your own already? Oh, well, so I had got a couple of the, the book clubs and especially I remember I had the Edmund Hamilton that was edited by Lee Brackett and then the Lee Brackett that was edited by Edmund Hamilton. And I thought that was cool. And Matt made a comment on there about that. And it kind of, I, I didn't really think much of it at the time, but then I started like looking into it a little bit more. And these were like the book club hardbacks. And then I started like just looking for photos online and I noticed these, um, you know, the paperbacks and I liked the way they looked. I liked how they all kind of had the, the same art style. And so I started like looking for those instead of the book clubs. Cause at one point I was thinking, I'll I'll get into the the book club collecting of these, but paperbacks take up less space. I like the way they look, and I like the the art better on these so far. Ira, how did you find them and start to get into collecting those? Or not Ira? Sorry, meaning Matt. How did you start to get into collecting these? Uh, once I noticed I had a decent amount, <laughs> as with any uh, series of books, you go, oh, you know what? It wouldn't take much to to have all of them. And I don't have all of them yet. But uh, really, in the last year and a half, my interest in older authors from like the 30s on has really increased. It's the majority of what I've read lately. Um, so it just made sense to start collecting these. Uh, and I can't remember how many I've read now. I think five five of them um and they're all great it's probably the best way to um try out an author would be a best of collection um there's lots of authors um that i haven't read anything of which i'll probably get to for the first time in uh these and you know what? i don't i don't know about you guys but when it goes to comes to collections versus anthologies there's strength to each of those but i do like what you're just saying about how it gives you a real good feel for that author. And perhaps you'll decide I'd like to find some novels by that author or some other work by that author. Absolutely. Um, uh, my first CL Moore and Lee Brackett, um, and Edmund Hamilton were all the best ofs. And I've mm -hmm. loved each of those authors. Um, especially the first two, like just became obsessed <laughs> with both <laughs> of them. So yeah, it's a great way to, and like Ira said, the artwork is great for these, especially the um, most of them have the same um, livery. And yeah, I would love to collect the book club editions of them, but um, I currently have one, <laughs> which is the Edmund Hamilton. So I don't think that's going to happen. But those also have excellent cover art. And the cover art for most of them is by H.R. Van Dongen. Is that who uh, did this one here? Yeah. 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 I noticed yeah, his I aliens kind of have a same sort of a, a look to them, a bit of a that big eyed look to them. Here, I'll just hold it up again. Yeah. I've started looking at the, um, the artist when I noticed that I really like a book. And that name has come up a lot recently. And I've never heard of him before, but I think I definitely like um his art style if it is a he i guess oh that's true and what i like as well at least for this book the art is directly from a story in the book uh, yes <laughs> and uh 
as much as I like spaceships flying through the through space, if they're not set in space, it really bothers me a bit. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, first take, just general impression about uh, the book, about the the writing, perhaps of uh, Hal Clement. I guess I can um, start. Yeah, or, yeah, sure. So I I recently read. Um, mission of gravity and if you haven't read that it's fantastic and so i was kind of used to his writing and i read the introduction here and and he talked about in the introduction saying he's a teacher and then he writes on the side and i think that put me in the right mindset of some of these stories and uh, some of them are a little on the drier side but Overall, I really liked them. I liked that the style of the hard science fiction. All the stories except for one of them had like heartwarming feelings almost, or they were in a positive nature. There was one that um, kind of was a anomaly in there, but overall, I really liked the whole collection except for maybe a couple of them. Yeah, definitely um, dry at times, but still exciting. Like. I would compare him to Arthur C. Clarke in both kind of like prose and the themes, obviously more hard SF, but um, I liked the majority of it. Surprisingly, I did not like the collection as much as I expected, but I still loved uh, a handful of them. Uh, and there were a couple that I just was not, not really all that into. I do like that. Like you can tell he's a teacher. Um, half the time you can tell like you could probably solve the mystery of the story if you're really thinking about it um most of the time i did not <laughs> and there's the one story where i'm sure you're able to solve it but it was beyond me i couldn't figure out i was missing um something i think maybe ira you had the same experience we briefly touched on it in an email i'm sure we'll talk about it um but overall like enjoyable really good and like one of obviously one of the pioneers of hard sf when I was uh, reading it, I sort of had some of the same feelings you had, Matt. Um, uh, I always dangerously come into books with expectations that, oh, this is going to be so good. And it was a bit of a dry read at times. Um, I started thinking about, this is a weird metaphor. I started thinking about the original Star Trek and you have Kirk. And I was thinking, you know, Kirk... He's kind of like the Alfred Bester in science fiction, if he was a writer. And then I was thinking, okay, we got uh, Bones, the medical guy. James White, this isn't the hospital one, but he writes hospital stories in space. And then I thought, if Spock wrote science fiction, that's what this would be. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's sort of a logical, scientific, working out without a lot of emotional uh, um, impact in the storytelling, I think. Um, but there yeah, is definitely looking, some... Go ahead. If you're looking for deep character work, this, you know, Hal might not be the place to go, and especially <laughs> in these short stories. Um, but even in, from what I've seen of his novels, they're, you know, they're along these lines more. Yeah. yeah. And they are what they are, and they're, you know, they are fun to read and fun to to see him puzzle through these uh, situations he presents to us. Mm -hmm. So uh, do we want to talk about a, a few stories in here, perhaps uh, stories that uh, have stuck with you or that you'd like to discuss? Sure. I think the collection starts out strong uh, with impediment mm -hmm. from a, uh, I can't, I can't remember if it was his first or second published story, or maybe I'm misremembering what I read about it, but I know he read it or wrote it early on. 1942. I think wrote, yeah, I think he wrote in the afterword that he was 19 when he wrote it, which is I think is impressive. Like I thought it was a good story, and I like in the afterword how he talks about um, he's very skeptical of telepathy, but he wanted to write a story, and like sure enough, he kind of has that scientific aspect of um, well, there is telepathy, but it doesn't quite work like. Um, well, like the Telsey Amberton stories, really, where, you know, you can read any mind if you have the ability. It was, I like how he worked at it, worked it out. And I liked the, uh, 
the relationship between the kind of the main alien in that and the human kind of <laughs> the humans not really trusting them just instinctually and um he ends up kind of being right in the end with his assumptions i thought it was pretty cool i guess i, sh I didn't really set up the story at all <laughs> Obviously, it's a story about uh, telepathy, but as you say, it's not the kind of story we're used to seeing from 1960s or earlier science fiction. No. Uh, it's It just starts out with this um, guy kind of on a retreat in the forest on his own, and he just comes across a potentially derelict spacecraft in the woods, decides to um, check it out, goes inside and looks around, and little does he know there's... There's like these alien, um, I guess they're insectoid, right? They're kind of, um, actually, I forgot I had this collection. I had already read this story called Natives of Space. And I think if you've read Impediment, it's pretty fair to guess that this is kind of some stylized art. Um, because the alien creatures are kind of like butterflies. And that's definitely, I think, what we have going on here. Hmm. Um, then, of course, one of these one of these alien creatures it has like a telepathic ability has always been able to read the minds of his own kind, but um, has to figure out how to work around a human mind. And I really enjoyed like the interactions between them where they kind of get to learn each other, um, understand each other sort of thing. And then you have the human kind of thinking, I'm not sure these guys are on the level. Uh, I'm not sure what I should tell them or um, if I can even help them with their predicament. Um, I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> So the thing I thought was interesting too, that I guess never really thought about too hard. How it makes you think that's one thing, but I thought like with telepathy, you'd almost be reading paragraphs out of the person's head, you know, but they were talking about how you're, you're, they're reading the essence of their ideas basically and getting the full, you know, breadth of what they want to say. And they don't have to fumble with language to try to explain what they're feeling. So thought that was kind of a nice little twist on it. And as you were saying, it's a connection between alien minds. So they were having to uh, almost go through a Helen Keller experience. Uh, if you're familiar with her, she was deaf and mute. And she had they had to figure out a way of teaching her how she could communicate. And uh, I thought it was very fascinating. And I thought that's what the story was going to be all about. But the ending takes it a different way. And that was kind of fun. It was also kind of funny just thrown in at the end. Um, the aliens, like they had faster than light travel, but they didn't really understand it. They didn't realize they were gone so long from their home system that <laughs> um, they could have returned and probably uh, avoided what they were afraid of kind of thing and just blended back into society. Um, the thing they were running away from was probably long over. <laughs> I thought that was neat. If a little unbelievable that you could <laughs> develop FTL, but not really understand something so basic. <laughs> Ira, was there a story that uh, you like to bring well, up? Yeah, the the story um, assumption unjustified, and that was the basis of this cover art, right? Mm -hmm. And when I was looking at this cover art, I was thinking. Is the alien helping him, like giving him a blood transfusion, or is he stealing blood from him? You know, so once I realized that that was the story that we were reading, um, I was really intrigued on how it was going to unfold. And I get, I don't know if we're doing spoilers on this or whatnot, but you can warn them if you want to do a spoiler on this story specifically. They're short stories. I don't think people will mind too much, but. Um, it was it was good. I liked the how the so the setup for this one, I guess some aliens are traveling through and through the galaxy. They're on vac going to a, a planet for on vacation. They stop by Earth um, to kind of they need to, someone needs to um, refuel in a way. <laughs> and they kind of land near these like gravel pits outside of this town, right? Or there's these little ponds, whatever they were. And these townsfolk were coming by and swimming and doing stuff. And so they had to like hide their spacecraft and 
then you kind of started realizing what they were doing. And, you know, then you get to the point where you get to the, the cover art here and you find out that he needs the, the male needed um, some rejuvenation. And so he's tapping into this human and they're going to take off after that and, and go the rest of the way on their vacation. And there's a, a kind of a cool twist at the end of this one too, but I, I probably I'll leave that one and not spoil that part of it. I wouldn't call them exactly space vampires, but they, they have a need for blood. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a very interesting need. But, and the alien was like concerned with the safety of this human. He didn't want mm -hmm. him to die. Um, he went out of his way to make sure he was okay. He did the, the wrong math. He should have been, probably working on an adult, right? <laughs> mm. Yeah, he thought yeah. this was an adult, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, he didn't do enough research. And I also loved that whatever alien had previously visited planet Earth and filled out an entry in the little guidebook, <laughs> apparently just never left like a five mile radius. And he just assumed, well, this is the planet. <laughs> this is what the, where they're at and left. Um, and these guys arrive thinking it's practically the stone age, but then there's a jet and they're like, Oh, we got to be a lot more careful than we thought. <laughs> I, I thought think was, assumptions is a theme was... through some of these stories, right? Yeah. Uh, mistaken assumptions or not reading a situation, right. Seem to play into a lot of the problems. Yep. I like some of the titles of these too. I like mistaken for granted instead of, you know, um, yeah, that's the, the a story I did not really care for, but it is a good title. Yeah. And uh, a question for guilt. Um, you know, I just got to check my notes about which one that is. Is that the that was the another, other vampire? It's another one. vampire story. <laughs> yeah. Ah, what's what's the one where we. Oh, that's right. What's the one where the uh, guy is hiding in the cave and wants to get back to the ship, but the other people have mutinied oh, on him? Uncommon sense. Uncommon sense. I really See, thought that I, was. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, just when I got to the end of that, I thought this is a great character for further short stories, and sure enough, we get one at the end. Yeah. And uh, apparently, there's two others that he wrote later. Okay. Cunningham. Yeah. Yeah. It reminded me of a uh, Stanley G. Weinbaum, who I think the best of his was the first book in the series. Uh, he has a character called Ham Hamilton or Ham Hammond or something. And it's very similar. He's always on a planet um, in a predicament and he's got to solve a mystery kind of thing. Yeah. But uh, I really liked that one and a little less so, but the other Laird Cunningham story too. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that we're going to run out of time here. Uh, so how about uh, you give sort of your overall impression again and maybe a rating or, or whether you would recommend this book to people watching. Sure. Um, I gave it a three out of five on Goodreads, which for me usually means like I enjoyed it. It just wasn't my absolute favorite thing. I think um, I realized how Clement was much more of a hard SF writer than I originally thought. Uh, and I think he probably undoubtedly influenced a lot of hard SF to come after. Um, and even the stuff that wasn't really SF, like the second vampire story, like I was super impressed by it. It's, it's like it's science fiction, but it's also not um, dry like I kind of expected, like Arthur C. Clarke sort of, but still enjoyable. And I would say um, absolutely worth recommending to anyone who likes like problem solving SF or hard SF, stuff like that. Absolutely worth checking out. Yeah, I also gave it a three. Um, I, I think he... I liked Mission of Gravity a lot more, but I still really enjoyed this. I think, like you said, if if you're into hard science fiction, if you're willing to, I think to get the most out of this, you have to understand that it is a, pro a lot of these are problem solving stories. So if you, like when I first read uh, Technical Error, I was like, what is the point of this, this story? Yeah. That's the one with the rocket ship that, you know, two blew up and one didn't. And it's like, well, why didn't one blow up? And I, I think I'm onto something there, but um, I might have to 
ping the community and, and so we can figure this one out because it's been bothering me. I think it has to do with the ion drive maybe. But um, so once I didn't like that story and then I remembered him talking about being a teacher and then I said, I think I missed something. And now I've been thinking about that story for weeks now. And <laughs> um, so if you come up with that in mind, I think you'll enjoy this one a lot more. Yeah, I know. I, I'm not sure about that story as well. I thought I knew what was going on, but there's a spaceship that seems to look like their old spaceship, and I'm not sure why. But yeah. we'll talk about that another time, perhaps, or in our comments. Uh, I also gave it, for me, I do out of 10, a 6 out of 10. And uh, it's a great problem-solving, hard science fiction novel. The the stories are actually quite long. For a book that is about 380 pages, there's only 10 stories. And that's because he always had to set up the situation, talk about the science, and work it through, work the problem. Um, so knowing that, going into it, I think you'll have a great time if that's what you'd like to get out of this book. So guys, I appreciate uh, you coming on and, and chatting about this. And... Um, if things work out, I think we want to uh, visit each other's channels and do some more best ofs. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thanks. Thanks to Matt from Science Fiction Reads and Ira from SF Words of Wonder. As always, keep reading. After filming the conversation, we had a discussion about which best of we would read next. The best of Lee Brackett. I'll end with a picture of the 21 books in the Ballantine Classic Library of Science Fiction. These books came out from 1974 to 1979. Until next time, keep reading.